Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Trust you had a quick little break there. No rest for us. We're straight into our next one. We're hearing about data analytics for transportation systems optimization. And Adriana Simonia, Simona uh, Mahatia, boy, oh boy, senior lecturer and lead at UTS Future Mobility Lab from the University of Technology, Sydney, is here to tell us more. So Dr. Mihaita is a senior lecturer at the University of Technology in Sydney, leading the Future Mobility Lab. Her focus is on syn synergizing traffic simulation and optimization techniques by using artificial intelligence to improve the traffic congestion, predict the, predict the accident, incident duration, build multimodal public transport optimization, and evaluate the impact of electric and connected autonomous vehicles. Dr. Maiheta holds several leaderships leadership roles in various initiatives such as the Australian Singapore Strategic Collaboration Partnership via the ARC linkage collaboration, the electric vehicle modeling impact with the Australian energy market operator, the Premier's innovative initiative with TF NSW previously as previously being part of data 61 on the demand mobility trials in the northern beaches run by Kios Downer the investigation of positioning accuracy of connected vehicles operated by road safety center in TF NSW etc she's a group winner of the 2018 national ITS awards awarded the IEEE senior member in 2020 and a finalist in the 2019 smart cities award and a nominee for the 2019 prime minister's science awards we are so lucky to have you here today um, Adriana, thank you very much for coming and sharing your stuff with us. Thank you, David, for the introduction. And indeed, my family name is a bit hard to pronounce. Um, and uh, it's originally Mihaita, but a lot of uh, uh, consonants in there. So just Simona, it's totally fine. Thank you so okay. much for having me. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Simona. Um, good morning, everyone. I hope you see my screen now. All good. Um, so my name is Simona. As David said, I'm currently a senior lecturer in the University of Technology, Sydney. I am part of the elite research organization, the Data Science Institute, and I'm currently leading the Future Mobility Lab, uh, giving the topic of uh, today's event, which is around using public sector data in order to provide insights and uh, valuable data analytics. I thought that a perfect topic would be to talk about our work around the data analytics for transportation systems. I am presenting today, but uh, behind the work that I will be talking about, there are many other collaborators and I would like to um, say a big uh, thank you, first of all, to our um, executive director, distinguished Professor Fang Chen, who is leading our work in this whole data science uh, space, but also my colleagues, Yang Yuming Tu and Sin Hyun, for contributing equally to this work. Um, that being said, I'm going to start by giving you an introduction in who we are. Some people have heard about us, but maybe are, many are not familiar. And then I'm going to talk about how we have used um, various uh, data sources in order to provide um, insights and useful um, information with regards to bus movement, um, the GIS platform that we have built in order to understand the impact of COVID-19, especially last year. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, also how we use uh, real-time data in order to estimate the bus speeds on our roads. And then the last part is going to focus more around train modeling and what type of data we have built in or we have used in order to build um, dedicated train modeling uh, systems. Um, so University of Technology, for those watching from Australia and are familiar with, but from those watching from internationally, we are currently very happy. Just two days ago, we have been ranked number one in Australia 
by the academic ranking of world universities for computer science. Uh, and this is actually the third year in a row. We were also surprised that we have now reached uh, number um, 11 globally due to the computer science um, capabilities ahead of University of Toronto and Princeton. So we were really happy about that. Um, actually, this is not surprising given the UTS 2027 strategies and for many years now, UTS has invested a lot in increasing their innovation and research capability and this starting to pay off. We are also recognized by the Australian Research Council um, uh, in AI and our research is rated well above world uh, standing. Um, the Data Science Institute has been built in 2019 exactly with this purpose of applying data science across all sorts of large data sets in order to provide valuable insights. We are currently um, having more than 35 full-time researchers and engineers, plenty of PhD students and research assistants, and um, the main focus of the group is around the utilization of data science machine learning coupled with software engineering and data engineering in order to provide insights. We have inside the Institute two of the Eureka Prize winners. Um, this is considered as the Australian Oscars for, for research, um, research output. Um, and Professor Fang Chen and Long Bing Hao are the ones obtaining this, this prize. Um, we have several um, ARC Future Fellows and so on. What is actually different about us is that we have been, we are a research intensive institute and the main purpose is to work with government agencies and also with industry partners in order to deliver valuable insights to them. Uh, I have listed here some of our government partners that we have been working previous with, the New South Wales Department of Education, Transfer New South Wales, New South Wales Health, the Public Service Commission, and so on. Uh, industry partners, we worked across Sydney Water, Sydney Trains, Acer, and so on. Um, there is also recognition that is being given to us, various um, awards that we have been um, provided during the years and we are happy because this is a recognition of what we are doing. UTS also has world-class infrastructure. Um, they have invested massively in building um, new facilities for their research staff, their students. Uh, also is one of the few institutions, um, universities in Australia that has a 360 degree collaborative and immersive room. This is extremely powerful and provides immersion into a, um, a, a virtual environment where you imagine yourself just um, navigating across millions of data points, say for example from LiDAR or from, from billions of other um, uh, data that represents a system. This is really powerful. We also have the Acer Predator Lab, which provides also like an immersive type of gaming with virtual reality inside virtual environments as well. Um, the way we work is basically we start with foundational science, uh, but what we do, we translate that into applying it to practical problems. And via this type of partnerships with government and industry, we start getting um, insights and we deliver real outcomes that can be further used. Of course, we publish as well our results um, into um, uh, Q1 journals and so on. This is an overview diagram of what the UTS Data Science Institute is currently doing. And um, as I mentioned previously, we are applying all sorts of data-driven uh, techniques for many domains, either is water, energy, finance, or um, transport, healthcare, and so on, all these domains have something in common, which is a lot of data. Uh, and what exactly we are doing with all this data? We are focusing on a palette of um, uh, features or components that we are uh, working on. Either we're talking about data visualization, Either we're talking about applying machine learning and optimization techniques, either we're talking about simply building some platforms or some cloud big data processing. All of this is part of our work with data and based on the needs and based on the necessities 
um, uh, that come to us. Myself, I represent the application of data science in transport and smart cities. And as previously mentioned, I'm currently leading the Future Mobility Lab inside this institute. You can find here on fmlab.org a lot of information of the projects that we're doing. And I'm summarizing them as well here. Um, as previously mentioned, machine learning is a powerful, powerful tool. Everybody has, taught, has uh, heard about it. And we are applying, for example, to predict how long incidents will last into the cities. We are also building a lot of um, traffic modeling simulations for at, at various levels, at macro, meso, and micro. This is mostly transport intensive focus. We have been also being involved in doing a lot of public transport analytics. You will see a lot of that today. Um, and also, the impact we, we use that type of data to analyze the impact of disruptions such as COVID-19 last year. Uh, we're also working with um, um, IRAP and TomTom Tom, um, and Transport Municipal Wells in order to be able to automate the road safety um, star rating. And also, we've been involved in modeling the impact of electric vehicles on our roads and all sorts of smart city modeling, of course, with either pure data or then just using some artificial intelligence to be able to predict how the traffic will evolve. So as I mentioned to you, I'm going to start talking about some of these applications. And I'm going to begin with our work around big data processing um, for bus delay analytics and what we have done that with regards to the COVID-19. So the bus, uh, the bus movement is currently being provided and is made publicly available um, via Open Data Hub. And the general transit field specifications, the GTFS, provides very good insights of how um, each vehicle of public transport modes are currently circulating in our cities. This data set is very powerful. Uh, what we are using from it, we are using the real-time bus positioning data, as you can see here. And um, this is transmitted along the roads in our cities. Um, we, I do have to mention that GTFS comes also with a lot of positioning errors. So while this might look nice, there are other regions in the city where the GTFS positioning is simply um, going off tracks and has a lot of jitter and so on. So on top of that, we are using the bus timetable data. What you see on this figure on the right, we, plot, we plotted the timetable in green. This is the planned timetable of a specific bus line. And what you see with orange is actually the real time performance that we have been recorded of this bus movement. So as you can see, sometimes buses are on time and they manage to get in time to the um, planned bus stops. However, when they get into more congested areas into the city, they start accumulating delay, which is very hard to catch upon until even the end of the trip. Sometimes this delay can be even worse. On top of that, we are using the bus stop geolocations, as you can see in this mapping figure here across the entire city of Sydney, plus also the bus routes and stops from, uh, from all the roads. This allows us to match those GTFS points to a planned route and also um, a dedicated stop um, uh, in the city. There is an entire process behind, so this presentation might be a little bit more technical than the other presentations. Um, I'm not going to go in a lot of details. I'm just going to say that we are interrogating the bus positioning data APIs. We are crawling the positioning data every five seconds, but the timetable and network daily. We are saving all this data set, and we are also checking from duplicates. One of the big challenges when you have real-time data sets is that you can have a lot of duplicated information or even missing information for quite a period of time. And this is not really helpful in order to build any type of analytics. So in order to do that, you need to be able to first detect and then get rid of unuseful information. Once we do that, then data is persisted that fine. We can proceed to store that data. Uh, next, we are actually going to the LGAs level. The LGA stands for local government um, areas, and these are standard definitions um, that are being used currently um, in all the cities across Australia. And these are standard reference for whenever you want to have good analytics um, across a specific part of the city. 
So what we are doing with all that data that I just showed earlier, we are matching it. First, we are matching it to the road, and then we are matching it as well to this LGA um, um, areas. Uh, we correct where the data is wrong or has abnormal abnormal behavior, and based on that, we calculate the arrival time estimation, which is basically a difference between what was planned and what um, what the bus is using. You have seen many of apps um, that are providing you an estimated time of arrival or that are providing you a delay, where it's actually this type of process where you're comparing your real time data versus what is planned. So we are storing absolutely all this information and we've been doing that for quite a few years, which allows us to have very good analytics of what happened to the entire uh, public transport network before and after specific situations. So COVID-19 started last year and it peaked around March. Um, the figure on the left, colored in blue, uh, actually shows the evolution of COVID cases around Sydney and the darker this color goes it means that the higher number of COVID cases have been registered. So we kept a track on that. And in parallel, we also kept a track on what was happening on the public transport in the city of Sydney. So where you see a difference in colors, the, the, the more intense the color, then basically there are some weird phenomena happening with the transport um, movement as well into the city of Sydney. And after close uh, investigation, we split this analysis into two parts. Um, we looked at the uh, area A, which was uh, central CBD and eastern suburbs versus what was happening in area B. It's more like the west part of the city of Sydney and wanted to see how this whole situation affects people moving in two different parts of the city. What we actually realized, it, it was really surprising. In this figure, you have a comparison of bus delay, average bus delay accumulated in um, central and eastern suburbs in February last year, and then versus March last year. So one month apart from each other. So definitely when before COVID, um, buses were accumulating a lot of delays um, along many routes um, into the city. However, when COVID came and all the travel restrictions started to happen, all of a sudden the public transport network, the bus network, was performing at fantastic, um, fantastic KPIs. So the delay seems seemed to have gone. Of course, less traffic on the road, which impacted of buses that were using shared uh, lanes, and therefore a very good performance of the bus network. However, uh, this was not the same in all the city of Sydney. While definitely in the eastern suburbs there was an improvement, um, as you can see here, we looked at the distribution of this um, average delay before the one marked in blue and after the one marked in um, uh, brown. And it did, it had the significant reductions. And I think around 5 p.m. in the afternoon, the buses really improved their delay by even 10 minutes. So they were usually 10 minutes late or 15 minutes late to specific stations, but after that it was good. However, part B, which was far west in the city, did not experience absolutely any change in the bus delays. As you can see from this distributions, they're perfectly almost matching to each other, which means that COVID situation did not impact at all how people were using public transport in the west part of Sydney. And this was quite surprising. Data sometimes can give you this magical insights which make you So going next, um, I was saying that we uh, worked for the next stage together with Dr. Jan Opperman and we built um, a more uh, larger piece which is called the GIS analytics platforms to not only look at the travel movement around the city of Sydney, but also looked at other aspects and other factors. So we did integrate in the bus movement and trying to look at each area, how that impacted, but we also integrated employment data sets and employment, we, we did this employment analytics uh, across LGAs and it was surprising, for example, to see that Blacktown was one of the most affected areas 
by the whole COVID situation. And you can also see that north of Sydney, the Gosford area as well suffered from this whole uh, restrictions and uh, just delaying putting everything on pause. We also integrated the rate, um, the rates of um, uh, rents across the city of Sydney. Um, as you know, more people were moving out of CBD, did not want to come to work anymore, or they couldn't. So definitely rents around the center of Sydney went down. However, surprisingly, rents in the regional areas of Sydney went up. So it's really this behavioral, how should I say, a rolling effect that such disruption can have, which it's very hard to understand unless you look at data and unless you look at various factors that can influence that. I think we also merged the bushfires analytics as well into this to see, uh, for example, the Robodara, which was really affected last year, and so on. So the the power of the power of this GIS analytics it's it's extremely huge and can give you insights at, at broader, different levels, um, uh, enabling decision making. Uh, we used also the bus data, the real time data, in order to do um, real time speed um, predictions. Um, as you know, currently the um, um, the travel times around our cities uh, are provided by some of the major major platforms, Google Travel Time, and so on. However, they are aggregated based on individual contributions of movement. Instead, this type of real time GTFS data can give you exact positioning of buses. So when you are in merging all this data information, you can have very good insights at every hour of the day, how uh, your public transport um, speed is being affected, what the road uh, sections are mostly affected, and make decisions afterwards. So very powerful. Uh, the last part is going to be around train modeling. So um, I'm going to talk about two cases, v -Line, the work we've done for V-Line Victoria and also for Sydney trains. Um, when you are talking about, I want to do a, a train modeling, a lot of people may think, oh, that's cool, that's nice. However, this is just a snapshot to say how much data is required to be put into even um, a train model. So first of all, you need the base network layout of that network. You need to know the segment interconnections, how different segments of your train network are being connected with each other. You need to know the timetable information, both planned and also real time information. When you do integrate that, also you need to know your train specifications, how many carriages, how what's the max speed of each train that is, is circulating in the network. You need to know passengers, where how many passengers are boarding, onboarding and off boarding. Um, you need to know traffic signal information, how these are changing together with your timetable. And last but not least, if you want accidents, you need to have um, traffic accident information. So as you can see, a lot of data is required if you really want to have like a good modeling of your network. Um, this is just a video example. As I said, for VLINE, we have built this modeling situation uh, and we integrated all the previous data sets that you have seen uh, into one model. Why would you ask me? Uh, there are two major reasons. One is for operational planning, um, timetable evaluation, optimizing specific stops, um, specific times at specific stops, but also the major reason was also to evaluate the resilience of the network when we're having disruptions, either incidents that are being signalized or either, either is planned or unplanned. Because this type of platform giving you, once you put all the data together, it's extremely powerful to see um, how your network behaves under, under such disruptions. And you can test what if scenarios, you can make a lot of precious decisions that otherwise it will be very hard to make. We use that also for incidents. So um, we all know about the uh, train cascading effect. When an incident happens, basically all the trains are blocked. Uh, along one line. So this allows you to really know which stations are impacted and for how long and what should you do next in this cascading effect of train um, uh, uh, of, of train being affected. 
And from the passenger side, we also uh, modeled the passengers. This is a, just an example of the Tarnit station that you can see here. Um, there are a lot of people in and out of the stations. And this was early morning, um, an incident that happened um, uh, on the station only for the people going to CBD. So people going um, outbound from center to the peripheric, not a problem. However, uh, people going to the CBD were affected. So as time goes by, basically more and more people start to accumulate on the platforms. This is a 3D view of the same station. And this allows you to understand where people, in case of disruptions, where do they accumulate on your platform, um, what can you do to better redirect them, um, and so on. And they were even surprised to find out this, this type of powerful uh, insights into the pedestrians moving in and out of the platforms. So this, these are some examples of how data can provide you these valuable insights of how people move, how your system moves entirely, and, and then plan ahead or react when you need. For Sydney trains, uh, things are much uh, developed. Um, the, uh, throughout the several years, we have had on our hands several data sets. We've built data mining um, uh, procedures uh, for them. We applied machine learning as well in order to predict, for example, uh, the dwell time and delays. You'll see an example of computer vision as well. So it's, a, it's again, very rich in data. So we basically start with understanding what data is needed, uh, gathering that data together, and then building this data-driven anal analysis and platform that they can use to understand what's happening into the network and, of course, visualize it. So several products have been uh, constructed from performance analytics to the delay propagation estimation, also tracing back delay across the lines where it happened, why, and then finally evaluate the timetable. Um, this has been very powerful and um, very useful to them. Also in terms of passenger flow analytics, um, we have built computer vision algorithm using data, video data, they wanted to know as well the agglomeration of platforms and make decisions on where to basically place best the entries and exits from trains across all the platforms. So we managed to get around 97.85 average accuracy, which was really a good, a good, um, a good estimate. However, it's very challenging. This is not an easy task. It's very computationally intensive. Requires a lot of processing, it requires a lot of data to be merged together, um, and it, it's really a, an iterative process that goes through many rounds of refinement, as I would say. So definitely all this is possible because data is there, and all of this is possible because we we know what, what basically is required. Also, with the last part that I want to present, we did some data analytics for smart parking. This is um, smart parking, again, is generating a lot of data in our city and uh, people operating the smart par parking, they want to know when my parking is used at most, for how long, why are people not staying more in my parking, what should I do to incentivize that, increase, of course, the, the profit out of it, and so on. So we're currently working, um, this is Mornington Peninsula in Victoria, um, to build not only an integrated platform, but also a more smart predictive modeling that could tell you which parking slots are most uh, likely to be occupied for how long and so on. So we are currently building again an integrated system which is based on real-time information, but also on um, the KPIs, the arrival rate, state duration, and so on. Um, this is work in progress, and we're currently working to build the forecasting models and eventually the revenue estimations. Um, that being said, um, th this whole examples that I, I have uh, provided today um, are simply made to, to tell one big picture story. What is that? In order to build absolutely any type of analytics, analytics platform, you need to start with good and valuable data sets. If data is made available, then um, anything can be built out of it. 
So priority number one for any type of system that needs to be built is let's have access to that data. Also, not just have access to one small set or, or a small subset of that data is the most important is to have good and reliable data sets which have like a good frequency and a good completeness. Sometimes we see in our experience a lot of data sets that are being chunked or they are incomplete or they are basically um, put, um, put with um, a high frequency. Um, so, really sorry about that. Um, and this is actually influencing a lot uh, the outputs. The rule number one is, as you know, if, they, if the data that you're using is of bad quality, the output is, is going to be of bad quality. So, um, th this is the lesson learned. The other thing that we've learned is that real-time data sources are extremely powerful and extremely important in order to understand how people make decisions, how people move, how your system behaves, or in order to have a global overview of the, the, this economic situation around our cities, it's extremely important that we have access to good, reliable, real-time data. Uh, I also want to mention that data is one thing, and as data scientists, we are trained to work with that, not a problem. However, there is a big difference between what the phenomena is revealed by the data and also what that means. So what I like to tell everybody is that you cannot simply build data-driven models without having domain knowledge. So the domain knowledge and the experts in that domain are extremely valuable to merge together the findings from that data with that domain. Sometimes, you know, data can, be, can, can, be, uh, can have a lot of errors you can't really take anything out of good uh, from it. If you're just looking at that data, then your interpretation, of course, is going to miss out a lot of what is really happening. Whereas if you have a domain knowledge expert, um, then he can tell you immediately, there's something wrong with this piece of um, data set, try again or have a look because this phenomena should not happen. So it's this combination of working with the main knowledge experts and also data analysts together it's giving the most powerful combination to provide anything insightful and last but not least um this is a message towards government agencies um which need to be aware that providing free access to these data sets uh, especially for scientists like us who are always passionate to try out any sorts of crazy ideas and algorithms it's extremely a good way to get that free valuable output that otherwise you will not get by keeping some data sets, um, uh, uh, how should I say, protected and private only. Uh, privacy is a big issue. Uh, there's another topic for that. However, um, opening accessibility to data sets is like opening doors to another dimension of endless possibilities. With that being said, I would like to end and I would like to thank everyone for their attention and I'm ready to take up any questions. Great. Thanks, Lorna. That was that was fabulous. Um, just sort of when you were finishing off there with, with regards to the data quality perspective. And and I guess that's that's sort of where I, I, I sit in. I, I see a lot of people trying to leverage these new tools and do analytics. And they get excited about the tech and the tools, but then it's sort of the, how do you collaborate with these people that want to do data management and, and give you the best possible data and give you complete data and understood data? Um, do you, are they in your team or are you collaborating with, with them? I think these data experts should be on both sides. <laughs> so um, why do I say that? On our team, of course, the data experts are required because they need to know how to process, manipulate, build the models for predictions and so on. However, uh, as I mentioned, if there is no domain knowledge expert on the other side that knows what that data is, is talking about, right? We can only play with it and gain insight. So this is, for example, the perfect example was for VLine, where they have so much information, so much data, it's extremely powerful. However, for us, 
we didn't know how to interpret it. They're the main, the main knowledge experts. They are the one that told us, oh, pay attention to this specification, pay attention, ah, this is not useful, this is useful, and so on. So it's extremely, uh, it's extremely funny to see that no matter how much you try, you cannot do anything if you don't have those experts that can, can, can raise your alerts. And they are the ones who have worked in those fields maybe for countless of years. Um, so you, we need both sides. We need both sides yes. of data experts. Uh, absolutely. And, and if I could just start when, when you were doing your example and you were talking about bus delays and things like that, and the dimension that you chose was local government area. Now that's that's an interesting sort of dimension to, to fixate on, especially when now we are capable of identifying corridors and you know sort of simulate things. So is LGA a good dimension because there's some local government member that's interested to hear about it, or is there a implication of congestion um, because there's the same number? Isn't it supposed to be the same number of people in every LGA? Maybe not. Um, no. But, <laughs> <laughs> or, or is it that we tend to work in an LGA, and so we're we're going there? So, how come the LGA? The LGA have been used for reporting all, how should I say, all surveys, insights, all uh, census data. I mean, all the census data is aggregated to the LGA levels. All the surveys that are being conducted aggregated to the LGA levels. It's simply they are grouped by specific regional the regional aspects by postcodes and so on. So they are very well understood by the government officials. So that's why we we actually keep that to make it consistent. Um, however, granularity of reporting, this this we don't have any problem of going to corridor levels, you know, like neighborhood levels, street levels, and so on. That's not an issue. Um, it's just being consistent to what what is well understood and what can help better to make this this plan decisions around large areas yeah i'm not well i'm not surprised you've got all the data and you can go to that level of detail i might just finish up with one more here it was a question that was coming in about talking about people in the um uh in government agencies that want to get in in, in touch uh with uts do they would they come to talk to you specifically to find out more about um, how to engage UTS, whether it's from advice or guidance or some support, would they, can they contact you directly? Absolutely, absolutely. Please get in touch. Um, I put my email at the last slide of my presentation. You can find me online as well via LinkedIn, social media platforms. Just, yeah, get in touch. We are happy to welcome you um in our in our site and have a chat and of course uh, show you what we have around and then also discover what are your problems uh we've been doing a lot of um engagement this way and we realize that is the best way to engage with government agencies just by sitting down and understanding what what's the need what's the problem so definitely please do get in touch okay well i hope a lot of people are uh, sending you messages right now. Simona, thanks very much for sharing that. That was a great, that was a lot of data that you compacted and of course, transportation and data, uh, yeah, it, it's great. I, I worked a bit with Queensland Transport and um, that I just love the data. And, and, and <laughs> there. So, um, thank folks, thank you. Folks, we're now gonna go on a bit of a lunch break, so.